Over to your talk. Oh, thank you very much, Stefan, for inviting me. And now we're going to the most important part of the body, which is the abdomen. And I have no disclosures. If you want to send me an email, here is my email address. As you know, radiation therapy is used in nearly 70% of patients with cancer and plays a critical role in 25% of cancer cures. Most tumors of the GI tract, including the esophagus, pancreas, stomach, and rectum, are managed at least in part by radiation therapy. Now, as we all know, the problem is to give the greatest dose of, uh, to the tumor and limit uh, the side effects to adjacent organs. During the past 20 years, several new technologies have been developed that decrease morbidity and increase curative function, including what we've heard, IMRT and SBRT and uh, yttrium uh, therospheres. Now, symptoms of acute bowel toxicity occur in 60 to 80 percent of patients who receive curative radiation therapy of abdominal and pelvic tumors, and 5 to 15 percent will require interruption or alteration. Now, each year, about a quarter of a million people in the United States undergo radiation therapy for a variety of abdominal, pelvic, and retroperitoneal tumors, and they're at risk for both the solid organ and hollow viscous injury. So there are 15 million cancer survivors in the United States. 50% uh, have had abdominal pelvic cancer. 70% of these 50% have had some sort of radiation therapy. Up to 50% will have some degree of intestinal dysfunction. Usually it's rather mild. Uh, about 2 million people, however, will have some degree of post-radiation intestinal dysfunction. Now, only a fraction of these patients will actually seek medical attention uh, because after they see the radiation therapist, then they go back to their internist and don't see them again. Um, nearly 50% of patients who've had pelvic radiation therapy will have anorectal dysfunction with intermittent incontinence, bleeding, and fecal uh, urgency. Uh, we've heard this, uh, Stefan described about this, therapy-related factors, the dose, the volume of the GI tract irradiated, time dose fractionation parameters, and very importantly, is the patient receiving concomitant chemotherapy, or molecular target of therapy or immunotherapy. Then there are patient-related factors. Uh, have they had prior abdominal surgery or infection? You know, adhesions are going to keep the gut in the same position. It'll be more uh, likely to be injured. Is the patient diabetic, smoking, inflammatory bowel disease? Does the patient have scler scleroderma or uh, vascular problems? This will pre uh, predispose to radiation therapy complications. Uh, now, patients who have had radiation therapy carry continued lifetime risk of delayed complications. Now, this is old data, uh, and most of the GI studies I'm going to be showing you are from the prior century, because I'm seeing this less and less. I don't know whether they're getting endoscopy or the radiation therapy is getting better. I think it's a combination of both. Uh, the radiation tolerance of the GI tract, uh, the rectum is the least tolerant, and the duodenum is the most tolerant. Uh, acute effects of radiation therapy usually occur in the first three months after therapy, and late effects usually occur one year after therapy. The acute effects may be a precursor for the development of late effects. So let's first talk about the esophagus. And for the young people in the audience, this is an upper GI study. This is how we used to evaluate the uh, GI tract in the prior century. This image was obtained with a single breath hold, and notice the beautiful uh, fat suppression. Okay, the acute and chronic radiation effects on the esophagus have been reported to occur after 45 to 60 gray, given over six to eight weeks. The patients may have dysmotility, a peristalsis, failure to complete the primary esophageal wave. Mucosal edema occurs within four to uh, 12 weeks, and patients can get developed strictures, but obviously the differential is it can be very difficult. Peptic stricture, Barrett's mucosa, vascular rings, NG tube strictures, intramural lesions. That's why we're getting fewer and fewer GI studies. So here's a patient who had radiation therapy and tremendous tertiary contractions of the esophagus. Uh, primary esophageal strictures occur in 2 to 12 percent of patients who've had radiation therapy for lung or head and neck cancers. The majority are complex and may need several sessions of dilatation. So here's a patient who had a distal esophageal uh, therapy, um, cancer, uh, received IMRT, and the distal esophageal cancer was gone, but actually we see uh, in, in the yellow we see a radiation esophagitis, and in the blue we see um, uh, post-radiation changes in the lungs. And uh, this is from the prior century. Some of these are analog, um, digitized analog slides, so you can see all the dirt from the prior ones. But here uh, are some examples of radiation esophagitis from the prior uh, century. Here we can see a patient with a uh, 
uh, fistula, and here's another patient with a fistula to the lung. Here's the patient who no, well, uh, presents. Here's a patient who received proton beam therapy for non-small cell lung cancer and has an esophageal stricture. Uh, here's yet another patient. Uh, the patient's uh, thoracic uh, tumor was resolved, but the patient had radiation uh, pneumonitis, um, esophagitis. So again, the findings you see are dysmotility, mucosal edema. Let's talk about uh, gastroduodenal complications. And these usually occur in patients who have concomitant chemotherapy. Uh, they may be getting gemcitabine or GFR uh, inhibitors, and this certainly increases the risk of complications. Most cases of gastritis occur with doses between 45 and 60 grays over a five-week period. Uh, early uh, during radiation, uh, inflammation is associated with mucosal injury, and this gastritis can lead to nausea and vomiting. Frank ulcerations can occur uh, at or uh, during uh, the uh, radiation therapy, and ulcers may resolve uh, two weeks after the completion of radiation therapy. In acute gastritis, the uh, ulceration can manifest as a mural thickening of the stomach and gastric erosions and ulcerations. So here's uh, from the prior century. Uh, typically in uh, radiation injury, one sees pre-pyloric or pyloric ulcers. They're more typical in the acute phase, and they can be indistinguishable from peptic ulcer disease. Uh, often they are uh, unresponsive to uh, conventional therapy. In the chronic phase, uh, one can see narrowing and deformity of the antrum and pylorus without ulceration. The mucosa may be irregular and mimic gastric carcinoma. Uh, here's another one. This almost looks like Crohn's disease or uh, lymphoma involving uh, the gastroduodenal region, but this is an old case of a patient who had radiation therapy. Duodenal injury, I don't see that very much, but here's some old cases. It's most commonly seen in the descending duodenum and varies from large ulcerations to smooth strictures and uh, these ulcers usually poorly heal, and it's due to some degree of vascular damage. Now let's talk about uh, small bowel complications, which I do see. Acute radiation enteritis occurs in a majority of uh, patients who've had uh, significant radiation to the belly. They present with diarrhea, tenesmus, cramping, and incontinence. Uh, the diarrhea may begin three weeks from the start of therapy, and symptoms usually resolve with the cessation of therapy. It's primarily an effect on the mucosal stem cells within the crypts, and the radiation therapy damages the stem cells, and this leads to mucosal atrophy and intestinal inflammation, and the patient may get edema and decreased absorption from the small bowel. And uh, also, this is a KUB, or in a plain abdominal x-ray. This is another way we used to evaluate the uh, bowel in the old age. In the old days, one sees dilated small bowel with thickened valvular conventes. Here's a small bowel follow-through. One sees thickened valvular conventes, hypersecretion, and separation of bowel loops. This could be any disorder, but the patient had radiation therapy in this region. And here's a patient uh, with uh, acute symptoms, and here's after the... Uh, post-radiation therapy changes resolved. On CT, one sees dilated small bowel with thickened valvular conventes. And here we can see a patient who's got submucosal edema and mural thickening. And here's another patient with ulcerations. And it can look just like uh, Crohn's disease or just a segmental um, enteritis, and, but it usually will com uh, comport uh, to the radiation portal. Here's a patient who had pelvic radiation, and you can see uh, there's mural thickening of the rectum, but notice there's also a mural thickening of the involved uh, distal ileum, and there's mural thickening, and there's hyperenhancement of the mucosa. Chronic radiation enteritis, there's increase in uh, collagen deposition within the bowel, and this causes thickening and fixation. There's an end arteritis with occlusion of the vessel lumen causing ischemia. And it most commonly occurs in the terminal ileum because that's relatively fixed in most patients. And also, if the patients had prior surgery, uh, the adhesive disease will predispose that segment of bowel to radiation injury. Chronic radiation enteritis is typically seen 8 to 12 months following radiation therapy, but it may occur years after. Uh, the patients may present with diarrhea, malabsorption, fistula, partial or complete bowel obstruction. And here we can see some ulcerations. And another thing I've noticed, I think I'm, I want to write this up. This obviously is an obese patient, but I've noticed a radiated bowel after it, be, it heals, uh, like somebody with chronic Crohn's disease and chronic ulcerative colitis, I often will see submucosal fat in that region, and that uh, segment of bowel may be narrowed as well.
Let's talk about now colorectal complications. Acute radiation colitis or proctitis commonly occurs during radiation therapy. And on CT, one can see a uh, sawtooth uh, appearance of the haustrations. Uh, there can be increased attenuation in the mesorectal fat. And here's a bare minimum. Don't do this anymore for a patient with radiation proctitis. But here you can see the sawtooth appearance. And here's another patient with a sawtooth appearance. Another finding, I don't want to attribute it just to radiation therapy, but if the patient's getting a Vastin or if they're getting concomitant uh, uh, chemotherapy, such as Folfox, uh, these patients do have an increased incidence of perforation. And here we can see a patient with a rectal cancer that perforated uh, into the thigh. Here's another patient who was receiving uh, therapy for gastric cancer, and this segment of colon uh, became quite thickened and diseased and perforated. Uh, anorectal uh, radiation injury, these patients are really very uncomfortable. They have diarrhea, tenesmus, and hematochesia, and the patients are often socially disabled because they need to find the washroom quite quickly. Uh, here's a patient, uh, two different patients with chronic radiation proctitis. Uh, here's on the top case, we can see a fistula between the rectum and the vagina. And on the case on the bottom, we can see a fistula between the rectum and the bladder. On CTMR, uh, we can see mural thickening of the rectum and colon, increased perirectal fat, and colon strictures may develop as well. And here's another old case, a radiation stricture. But again, you know, the, the world in radiation share is so changed in the last 30 years that, as I, again, uh, these cases from barium studies are from the prior century. Uh, I'd like to conclude by talking a little bit about uh, solid organ injury, radiation-induced liver disease. As you know, the radi uh, liver is a highly radiosensitive organ, and it's at risk for irradiation uh, damage in patients who have esophageal, lung, uh, gallbladder, pancreas, and whole body irradiation. Radiation-induced liver disease occurs in 5 to 10 percent of patients who get 30 to 35 gray of uh, whole body radiation. Uh, what is uh, the radiation-induced liver disease? Patients have fatigue, increased LFTs, uh, anecteric hepatomegaly, and non-malignant ascites. In the interest of time, uh, there usually gets uh, sinusoidal congestion, hyperemia, and diffuse uh, fatty infiltration. Um, on CT and MR, hepatic veins and inferior vena cava may be difficult to identify because of extrinsic compression caused by an enlarged congested liver. And let me show you two examples. Uh, here we can see a patient who had, uh, you know, had whole body radiation. And this looks a little bit like Bud Chiari syndrome and actually sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, which this kind of is because we can see the narrowing of the right hepatic vein. And this is the finding on uh, CT. And here's another finding on MR. And again, uh, this could be a patient uh, uh, any patient with sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, but this is a patient who is getting whole body radiation, and we can see the narrowing of the right hepatic veins. Oops. And here we see a uh, narrowing of the veins as well. Uh, this could be somebody, uh, anybody with Budd-Chiari syndrome or sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, but if there's whole body radiation, think about this disorder as well. Uh, this is the typical appearance. We see a low attenuation area that corresponds to the radiation portal. And here's a patient who had uh, radiation uh, for a spinal injury. This was metastatic breast cancer. And you can see this low-density area on CT. And on this T2-weighted image, we can see some water, uh, increased uh, edema uh, within the irradiated portion of the liver. And it's usually a straight line. And if there's underlying steatosis, the irradiated portion of the lung may appear hyperattenuating relative to the uh, fatty liver. And here's another patient receiving radiation for gallbladder cancer, fatty liver. But uh, usually uh, the irradiated lung is going to be low in density. However, if you have an over underlying fatty liver, the irradiated part of the liver uh, may be hyperdense. Uh, Stereotactic uh, body radiation therapy, that can give you regions of low attenuation, as we see here on this uh, MR image. Uh, here's a patient also received proton beam therapy. So it's very important when you're interpreting the scans to know what type of therapy the patient had. And then patients are getting selective uh, uh, internal radiation therapy. And here we can see the initials uh, uh, lesion immediately following and then following these uh, therapeutic beads with uh, uh, Y90 
uh, you can see the post-radiation change. Pancreatic toxicity, well, the pancreas is relatively hardy. Uh, it's radio-resistant. You can get stromal edema and fibrosis, and in some cases, you may get chronic pancreatitis. Uh, chronic uh, pancreatitis, where you see just pancreatic atrophy. And here in red, you can see where the, um, a portion of the kidney was involved uh, in the radiation beam. Uh, renal toxicity, uh, here it looks like a, an irradiated portion of the liver. Uh, acute radiation nephritis, again, we don't see this fairly com uh, much anymore. Uh, normal size and shape of the kidney. In chronic radiation nephritis, uh, you have an atrophic, poorly functioning kidney. Uh, it corresponds to the radiation portal, and you may have compensatory hypertrophy of the non herated kidney if uh, you've irradiated a child. Uh, splenic toxicity. Uh, the spleen may be irradiated in patients with lymphoma or leukemia to decrease uh, the discomfort from splenomegaly, and the spleen is exquisitely radiosensitive. Um, uh, you, at doses as low as 4 to 8 gray can destroy lymphoid tissue within one hour. Fibrosis and atrophy in, are seen five to six weeks after doses of 35 to 40 gray. And there are no specific findings in acute exp uh, uh, exposure. And then late you can get atrophy as in this patient. Here's another patient who has a rather atrophic spleen. And uh, so in this... Uh, 20 minutes, I've tried to go over some of the abdominal manifestations of uh, radiation therapy. I think they're far fewer in number, especially of the, uh, the hollow GI tract, and it's important to know what the type of uh, the portal is, and happily, at our institution, we get to uh, view on our electronic medical record the portal, and it's also important to know if the patient's getting concurrent uh, chemotherapy. And with that, I thank you for your attention.